Welcome to the Perigee Podcast. This is Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force, John Bentevania, here at the AFA Warfare Symposium. And uh, we had a great couple days here, and one of the things we had an opportunity to do was to recognize the 2023 Polaris Award recipients uh, for the Space Force. And uh, we happen to have a few of the um, recipients here with us today. And so I'm excited to get a chance to engage with them and talk to them, ask them about Hey, what does it feel like to kind of represent the values of the service? How are their experience here at uh, AFA? So I'm hoping this will be a really good conversation um, with some of the best and brightest guardians that we have in the Space Force. So with us here today, so let, let me actually just go through the list real quick and uh, kind of recap who the, uh, the recipients of the awards were. So the Polaris winner or the Polaris recipient, if you will, of uh, the value for character was Tech Sergeant Isabel Childress. The recipient for the value of connection was Lieutenant Colonel Jessica Pratt. The recipient of the value for commitment was Lieutenant Jonathan Novak. And for courage, we have Captain Samantha Pereira here. And you know, we also have a team award, which kind of wraps up all of our values together into an organization of guardians who best represent that. And this year, um, that recognition went to the 22nd Space Operations Squadron Detachment 1 up in Montana. Um, so they were also here, the representatives this, this week as well at the events. So, so with that, with the, the three um, guardians we have with us today, I'm going to ask you to kind of introduce yourself a little bit and tell us kind of where you work, kind of what, what you do, and we'll kind of break the ice that way and get into a quick conversation. So we'll start with Tech Sergeant Childress. Morning, Chief. So I'm Technical Sergeant Isabel Childress. I'm a military training instructor at the 1st Delta Operations Squadron Detachment 1 in short-term Space Force BMT. So I get to work with our new guardians from the day they sign and raise their right hand until they leave my bomb run and ship out to tech schools. Yeah, that's. I had a chance to to visit BMT actually last week on, on my way out here, and uh, it's always um, it's such a rewarding experience to go down there and kind of see really that transformation, right? Some civilian life into you know being a military professional and becoming a guardian, and kind of shaping that that metal, if you will. Um, so for those of you who haven't had a chance to, to go down to BMT and witness a graduation in a while and maybe stop by and, and see the professionals we have down there, it's, it really is a reinvigorating experience. Absolutely. Thanks thanks for being here, Isabel. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Chief. I'm First Lieutenant Jonathan Novak. I'm the Chief Engineer at the 3rd Space Operations Squadron in Delta 9. I get to work with a team of extremely talented engineers, some of the smartest people I've met every day. and Honestly, I just like to say I'm trying to keep up with them every day, and that's what I'm doing on the day-to-day. -day. Um, I'm originally from Bel Air, Maryland, uh, up near the tip of the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, happy to be here, happy for the past few days. It has been a wonderful experience, amazing opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, thank, thanks, sir. I appreciate it. And you know what's kind of really great about, you know, something that we value as a service and kind of this event kind of... Um, illuminated that was this is family business you know when you when you serve and uh um isabel you, you had your husband here with your daughter right and sir your fiance was was here with you right yes sir. And, and that's right and and uh, capier your husband or you was here as well right yes or, uh yes my my daughter was here my mom my dad my grandma yeah, yeah that, that, all here. that that's great that's mm -hmm. great so with that capier why don't you tell us about yourself uh yes absolutely um thank you for this opportunity uh my name is captain sam Pereira. i'm from the third space operation squadron uh where we do tactics and training for the orbital warfare enterprise um I'm, I was the engineering flight commander and a lot of what um, my challenges were were to build a team for a developing squadron and I was really grateful for that opportunity. I got to work with a lot of amazing people. Um, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be here and then to also work with those teams. So, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. So, so what do you think? So you're here for a couple of days, went through the ceremony. you have any reflections? It was surreal. Um, I think I've I've met a lot of interesting people, uh, amazing people that I don't know that I would have met otherwise. Um, it's interesting that this was an air and space conference, so I got to meet a lot of air Air Force personnel as well and see what their perspectives were and and the the joint fight in that perspective. Um, it, it really was incredible, and uh, 
it has given me a lot of time to reflect too on where I sit and what my purpose is as part of a, a larger enterprise. Yeah, you know, one of the the things I think as as and, and I'll, I'll for the sake of the sake of the conversation put myself in in a category of senior leaders. You know, when we get together and have opportunities at, at forums like this, is is to really try and tell a narrative and explain to the service, right, to the men and women that are in the audience, just how vitally important they are for the work they do every day, right? And like you said, ma'am, to so kind of find your purpose and kind of see that that's the hope, right? Because because you sitting around the table, you're really executing the mission. You're doing the things that the nation has asked you to do, um, asked us to do as a service. And, you know, making sure that, you know, whether by in, in op-eds and speeches and PowerPoint slides that we produce, you know, the realization that the real work is, is being done by you and the guardians and airmen that you lead in your organizations and taking advantage of, of you know, get get goes like this, like like the symposium. Um, it, it really is the goal for me. And I know General Salzman feels the same way is right that you walk away from here realizing, OK, now now I know. Right. What the guidance and intent. How do we get after, for example, great power competition was the kind of the big um um, discussion we had at, at this symposium, but then it, that it kind of empowers you, right? Kind of gives you back that guidance and intent, mission command to go back to your organizations, whether that be operationally, right? What are the tactics, TTPs that we're putting together for an organization or for a weapon system, or when we're trying to develop and grow guardians, right? Understanding GPC, understand the criticality of the mission that we have, right? How do you forge them and shape them? How are you inspiring them from day one? Of, you know, for example, we're down at BMT. So I'm glad I'm glad that was something you kind of experienced because I know that that's kind of a goal that we, we kind of do. Lieutenant Novak, so so we talked about that your your fiance was here. Out of curiosity, was this her first kind of exposure to a military kind of ceremony? Genuinely anything military at all. So every single thing we did throughout these past few days, I was able to say, yeah, this is just what I do every day. And it's absolutely yeah, not. It's yeah. the over the top. You're, you're a big everything. deal. You're a big deal, sir. I got to tell her that. I'm like, no, nah, you know, this is how it is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm glad. And, 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 and I said, we talked about the fa family business, right? And, you know, it is sometimes too, when we're so close to what we do every day, you know, we get up in the morning, we put on our uniforms, right? We, we go to work and, and we, we do the things we've been trained to do and asked to do. Um, but, but we, we get so close to it. And sometimes, especially when someone, a family member, a loved one gets a, an opportunity to come experience something like this, and they kind of bring that different perspective, right? They kind of reground us to realize, wow, like, like it is really important what we do. And, and it's sometimes it's, it's very humbling, right? When they say, wow, like the conference is big and, you know, for, as an example, right? I think we talked about this, uh, at the ceremony, you know, for the, for the Players Awards, I think in 2023, there were over 13,000 guardians that were eligible for the awards in the, the format that we do right we don't we don't have break it down by categories by rank or whether you're officer or civilian it's it's our values in the team award and whether you're a civilian a guardian civilian or guardian officer or guardian enlisted you know you're all with you know, eligible for okay, who emulates the values that we have as a service and you know there's when you're called on stage and say you know you represent Right out of the thir over thirteen thousand people in twenty twenty three, it's just it's just an amazing thing, and to have maybe someone from the outside perspective bringing that to your attention, um, is can kind of rewarding, but it also it can be very humbling as well. So I'm I'm glad that, you know this first experience. Now I don't know when not every military experience will be as bougie as this one, so you got to you got to temper it temper it. But uh, I'm really glad she had a chance to enjoy it. Right. Thank you, sir. And to exactly what you were saying, that was the first time her parents, so her parents were there. It's the first time they ever even saw me in uniform. And they wow. really probably saw anyone in the military in uniform. And it was all the people. We walked into the room. I thought it was going to be, you know, a conference room. And then I saw 10,000 seats. And I wasn't nervous up until that point. And then we walked in for the practice. The seats weren't even filled yet. And everyone here at the table can tell you, I messed up every part of the practice. <laughs> and they went, okay, that's all the time we have to practice. So we're, we're getting back to it. And uh, when the seats were finally filled, yes, I was nervous. But it was fantastic that everyone was able to see it, uh, that the families were there. And that really that AWS let, let the families come on stage and be a part of it with us and acknowledge that none of the achievements happen without that support that's 
often not as visible. So I think that's one of the parts that really stuck out for her. Even even afterwards, when you when you shake hands with everyone and the Chiefs would say, you know, I know that this would not have happened without you. And let me just acknowledge that to you, to your face right now. And I know that went a really long way with her because, you know, we, we work across the country from each other. And so she often doesn't get that uh, side of it, the spousal side. And so a lot of it meant a lot on a lot of fronts. Good. Hey, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, sir. I, I appreciate it. Because um, we said, right, this is family business, you know, and 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 so our children. So you know, right, that you know, we we rec- we attract and recruit guardians, but we retain families, right, and that, and that's really important. So, uh, so I got to tell I got to tell um, the audience, if you will. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Um, the first time I think I met uh, Sergeant Childress was at the uh, Guardian Arena. Yes, Chief. And. Um, she very, very much made me nervous and intimidated me, you know, as a uh, military training instructor. Um, I felt like she was judging my, my boots weren't laced appropriately. I think I had some strings on my uniform, my OCPs. Your strings were good, sir. Don't I, worry. I, I was still very hesitant to put my hands in my pockets <laughs> like I was getting judged. Um, but, but we talked about last night when we had a little social. Um, you really are a really nice person. And, and, but to see you transform when I was at BMT right into the the basic mil the, the military training instructor um that the guardians need to, to kind of do that um it just amazes me to kind of do that and and you know when you represent character you know um in 2023 and you know the character required to do the job they have to do and to kind of help make that transformation for civilians I, I was would like to get your kind of perspective when you think about what we're asking you to do day to day and you think about character as a value, what are, what are your thoughts on that? How do you, you know, what the connection between there and your opportunity to kind of employ that every day? Absolutely. Um, kind of going back to what you said of seeing that transformation, I actually got to see a lot of my old coworkers and flight commanders here at the symposium and they see me with a hat and they're like, are you sure you're the same airman uh, sergeant that I knew a couple of years ago. I was like, this has been my dream job. But when we talk about character, um, even, even when you came to BMT last week, the Guardians asked you, what is your favorite core value? And when you talk about character, it's something we preach as an MTI core of, we have to hold each other accountable. We have to be honest. We want you to come in as a good person because we can help you shape everything else, but I can't shape a good uh, a good person. You come in to, as a good person, and I can help you get to where you need afterwards. And so it's really humbling to see the civilians that come through my doors as I'm yelling at them to get off the bus, pick up their luggages, and then uh, as they cross the bomb run and as their families thank me, saying that I've changed their uh, their son their daughter over seven weeks but truly it's just I gave them the tools for them to change and it's humbling to see all of that and to be an MTI and represent character it just shows us as an MTI core and my team we're doing the right things where we need to be so did you did you have in in your goal and when you when you say hey someday I want to go back to BNT and become a military training instructor was that something you always strive to to be was that a goal of yours the whole time or it was how did, it get, how did you get to that point <laughs> so I came into BMT as a trainee knowing I wanted to be a military training instructor one of my uh, lifelong mentors Chief Master Sergeant Conway he was a mentor of mine in high school he was a uh, military training instructor for eight years he was a first sergeant uh, retired as a, a chief first sergeant and I told myself I want to be just like him that man was essentially like a second dad to me um and help me become the person I was and along with my family. So I, I wanted to give back to the service. And if he could help change me, I, I wanted to give back either to the Air Force or the Space Force and help change and shape our next generation of airmen and guardians. Yeah, that's, you do amazing work. It, so, you know, c- kind of an opportunity to do kind of recruitment pitch. So, you know, people have this illusion that, um, um, you know, doing the work that you do, obviously it's, it's demanding, um, but would you, right, when, when you get a chance to say, hey, you, like we, we need MTIs, right? The people have to come through. You can't stay there forever. Um, what's, your, what's your kind of, what's your, what's your you know, 10-second elevator pitch and why, why Garden should think about going down and joining you down at BMT? I hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I know this wasn't something like. If I had a 10-second pitch, it's 
um, when we talk about the core value of connection, we're not just talking about the connection between each other, but families. And as you said, Chief, Space Force is a family business. If you want to shape the next generation of the Space Force, you want to shape the next generation of your coworkers or even our replacement, this is where we do it. We truly impact the culture of the next generation. Because when we talk about, I think you mentioned the OGs, guardians that have no other service, prior service knowledge, this is where it happened. And if members and guardians are willing to take forward the strides of hours are long, but I know what the work is going to turn out to be, that's where you need to be. Yeah. Th thanks for that. Thank yeah, I, 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 I don't know how I came upon the, the, the phrase. I, I don't know if someone gave it to me and I just picked up on it, but the OG, right, original guardian, <laughs> um, which kind of means something. And, and when I do say it, um, a lot of them are very proud of that, right, that they're the, the initial cadre, right, um, who didn't necessarily come from another service. Absolutely. Uh, to through that. So, so, you know, on the theme of, you know, talking about our, our values, so Captain Pereira, so courage, right? So you, you, you're the recipient of the Courage uh, Award. And, you know, reading the, you know, the, the things that, that you did and the courage you showed, you know, um, on a personal level and on an operational level, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes when you self-evaluate a, a, a unit and organization and to challenge them to make them better. Right. And not be afraid to call out and say, hey, maybe we didn't hit the mark and, and, and call out where we can improve. You know, a lot of times, especially when you talk about uniform service, when people talk about courage, I think a lot of peop people immediately go think of physical, physical courage. And, you know, as guardians, you know, as employed in place, you know, we really um, thrive and operate in a cognitive domain. Now, we have guardians that are intents behind behind barbed wire that you know that 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 are in in positions of, of physical danger um, but that you know and, and and but that's a small that's a small uh, subset of kind of what we present um, but courage takes all different forms and and I just kind of get from your perspective when you think about courage and kind of how you displayed it and 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 how you've had to kind of show courage and lean on courage as a value from what you're doing, if you want to maybe share some of your thoughts on that. Absolutely, Chief. Thank you. Um, and I, I don't think I could have said that any better myself. Um, it, there's definitely elements of courage where, you know, you run into a building, burning building, courage, absolutely. But there's there's smaller acts of courage that we can do every day. And when in the Space Force, it is a cognitive domain. And so that means that the some of our most pre precious assets are the ideas that we have. And when we put those ideas out, it puts us in a vulnerable position. Um, maybe your idea will get criticized. Maybe your plan will get criticized. And it really, it opens you up. And it takes some courage to say, hey, guys, I have an idea. Let's think about this. And maybe it's not the right time or maybe it's, uh, maybe there's some flaws. And it's, it takes a little gumption to say, okay, let's, let's take that back and rework it and present this again. And then keep presenting and presenting until you've got something that will work. Yeah. You know, when we talk about like the, you know, the, the guardian commitment, right. And when, when we talk about what it means to be a team leader and a, and a teammate, um, you know, and, and, and it's hard, right. Organizationally, right. To kind of have that, that courage on a, on a day to day basis where how do you hold each other a kind of accountable? Like you have a vision, like you want to be the best flight or the best unit, or you want to have a successful mission and self critiquing and, 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 and open yourself up to share some ideas and share your thoughts can be scary. Absolutely. It, chief. Especially when you think about, you know, the, the amount of talent, right. Um, that we have across a service, you know, you, a lot of times for me personally, when I'm sitting around a table and I look at men, there's a bunch of really smart, experienced people and I'm thinking about something. I'm like, all right, so I just keep my mouth shut or right. Do I add to the conversation? And, 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 and what I've learned is, you know, the, the safe space that I kind of find myself with other guardians that even if it's, I'm a little off the mark, I may start throughout there, but it enriches the conversation and may lead us down a path to a solution we otherwise we may not have gotten there. It may not have been my right, specific thing, but overarchingly it kind of helped the organization or the group get to where they needed to be. And I think that's such an important value that, that we feel comfortable to kind of show that courage to, to say and do the things that we need to do to make ourselves better and to hold ourselves uh, accountable. 
Um, and, and it takes a commitment to do that. Right? I have that have a commitment to do courage. So that nice little segue, right, to, um, to, to Lieutenant Novak. So, you know, commitment. Um, you know, we were talking the other day, and, we're, you know, you went to MIT, I think. Sir. Right, and it was uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. I think is that where you were. We we got to do all sorts of things there. So I was in the technology and policy program in the Schwarzman College of Computing, and then my research focus was in aerospace. So I got to touch all of it. Um, recently, I've been studying Hindi and AI on my own. So, so on your, so you, and I'm glad you added that. Thank you uh, on your own. So you're about commitment, right? Yes, Lifelong sir. learner. You know, committed to be the best version of your of yourself. Um, it takes discipline to, to, to kind of do that. And, you know, when you think about some of the conversations we had the last couple of days, right, you know, all the technology and the policy and, and all the money in the world, um, our asymmetric advantage is still all of you sitting around the table, right? It is it is the guardian. It is a human weapon system, uh, um, as we refer to, you know, at times. But it takes commitment, right, to kind of get, to kind of, hone ourselves into the war fighters that, that we need to be. And what I find fascinating about, about your story is that these are things you're doing on your own. Like, cause you're force mod. Are you a six, two, six, three? I'm a six, two, sir. Six, two. Right. So these things that, that you have a commitment to kind of learning about, isn't like, isn't something that we're driving you to do. You don't need it to make promotion. You don't need it for your development track necessarily. Um, but, but because you're, you're, you have a passion about, you know, technology and, and you look into kind of see how you can apply that. So, so, you know, have you seen, you know, in, since you've graduated and, and kind of been in Delta nine, um, you know, how is that commitment paid off in your ability to, to be the best version of yourself and also make the organization better because of the commitment that you have? Well, a lot of it just comes from this idea of trust and that I'm being given this trust and responsibility through whether it's Delta nine or whether the space force who sent me to graduate school. And so the, the trust and responsibility underpins that commitment. And then what, what often I see is I really just want to, I said it before, I'm trying to keep up with everybody I see at work. And so a lot of that commitment comes from if we're a team and we're, we're trying to get what we need to get done. Um, I don't want to be the one that's holding us back. So I want to catch up with everybody else. And that's what's driving a lot of this. You know, I'm studying when I get into work and I'm studying when I leave work and I'm trying to be as best as possible so that my one, my team can go, can go far. And then second, just so that if you're in this leadership position, you know, you have a team of engineers with you that you're capable to lead them far as well. Um, a lot of it's just because of how talented the people around me are that really motivates me and, and how much trust. So the, the tools, you know, they'll give me the tools. So the space force will give everyone as much learning resources as they need through digital university or Coursera or something like that. Um, but it's the trust that really makes me want to go embrace those tools and actually, actually get things done. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's powerful, right? That, um, trust empowerment. Um, you know, we talk a lot all the time about, um, retention right how do we retain the talent and we talk about the guardian experience which which is a big bucket right that's that's from you know access to health care and child care and paying compensation but it also includes like, like how are you treated at work right are we are we releasing you right to, to follow your passion and apply it towards the needs of the service and the needs of the guardians and, and that that could be really really powerful so so what makes you kind of thrive and what drives you? What, what, are, what are things that you do to kind of pay it forward? That's, that's, so the Space Force gave me everything I could ever ask for. You know, they, they covered my, my college degree. They covered my graduate degree. They've given me so much. And so a lot of it is I want to make sure that, one, because they trusted me with all of this, that I steward it well. Um, and that second, I pay it forward. So... A lot of that is, you know, I had these opportunities, all these great experiences, all these trainings, and I want to make sure the next generation gets that. And I kind of approach it from a, what I, I call it a DARPA model, where I know how long I have in the service and how long I have in each grade. And so that's sort of like my internal deadline to pay it forward. So, you know, commissioning, it might be, I have five years in my, in my service commitment, and I want to get as much done in that five years as possible. 
And a lot of that is just saying all these successes, all these great experiences I got, I want to make sure my people also get. So that's try. That's how I try to pay it forward. And I know, you know, from having been through it, how to navigate those and make sure that uh, they're they're always at the forefront of my people. It's really everything I think about is like everything in my in my package, all the things that I did with space centric acquisitions, every experience that I had, where I was like, I think this could be a little bit better, you know. So a lot of it was my initial training. Um, I wasn't like I'm done with initial training, so that's that's it. I was like. I know there's going to be thousands of guardians that go through initial training next. And although I've already gone through it, you can still improve it for them. And at the end of the day, what you have is a better team that had a better initial training and future generations are better for it. That, that's great. You know, I, um, General Salzman and I had the opportunity to um, have an engagement with a bunch of uh, cadets from the academy and from uh, Rachi detachments. And they were talking about, you know, leadership and, you know, the roles of a leader. And one of the things that, we, that um, we talked about that, um, you know, the, where we are today that really kind of tap into the talent and the leadership style that we need is less about trying to climb the ladder and more about building ladders, right? Are you, are you helping those around you succeed as well and sometimes surpass, right? Because there are individuals sometimes that you recognize that there's capability and competencies that maybe exceed your own. But it doesn't mean, right, we still have an obligation to, to pay it forward, right, and to kind of cultivate that and, and then take pride, right, that we've helped somebody kind of reach their full potential, even at kind of exceeds maybe where we were. But that's okay, right, because it, it's about the team. And it's about not necessarily comparing ourselves to others, but are, are we being the best version? Are we holding, are we comparing ourselves to who we think we can be? Um, and challenge ourselves to do that, which is, I mean, kind of really like the whole purpose of the Polaris o o recognition program, right? It wasn't comparing guardians against one another. It was looking at what the values mean and represent and looking at the, individually the guardians and saying, which one do we think represent the values? Not, okay, we have three, let's rack and stack and score that's not the process that we used. It was it was the individual guardian against the list of attributes that represent uh, the value, um, and and I received several um, comments, um, positive comments after the award ceremony. You know, after witnessing, I didn't understand what the hoop, especially a lot of uh, airmen and retirees that didn't understand the, the the Polaris process or the program, and I was like, wow, that's. First of all, it was it's kind of brave, innovative, right? The way that we approach it, and they really like, right? That is anchored in our value system. Um, so I, I think we're on. You know, this is our second year, um, so I, I think that we're on a path to success as we do this. And um, you know, one of the campaigns that the lessons learned from this last board was to make sure that you know across all the tactical levels that supervisors right at the lowest level and guardians at the lowest level understand the Polaris philosophy and all of them see themselves as eligible for the Polaris, you know, um, recognition program. So that's a little campaign we're going to do on, but it's really important that nuance. It's not comparing guardians against one another. It's about, you know, comparing them to what it, what the value kind of means. Certain so, children, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a minute and ask, um, you know, when you look back, you know, maybe we'll just frame it in, in the last year, right, in the 2023, um, what are you most proud of? That's a hard question to you. Yeah, I hate it when people ask me. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the career aspect, I'm I'm really proud that I was able to make some impact to our guardians. There are guardians that... Um, at the end of training, they thank me for being the one person in the corner. Sometimes they've grown up and there was no one saying that, hey, you can do it. And times when they ha when it, were going through life and I was able to just take off the campaign hat and just be an NCO to them, it's just talk to them. It's Those moments come full circle back to me. Um, but I'm also proud of doing my career, but also managing my home life. Um, being a, a new mom, so I PCS to Lackland and started school with a three-month-old, but I, I truly couldn't do it by myself. My husband gave up his career to be a stay-at-home dad for me, 
and for my daughter because he wanted uh, a sense of family for her because he was grow we grew up with family all around us but being in the military we don't really have that um they're all on the east coast now so i'm proud of being um mnti but i'm also proud of being a mom and a wife and hopefully a good one um working those long hours can be on, tough on us but i i truly couldn't have done it by myself no, th- th- thanks for sharing that and i know it, it's a hard question i but i think you know, I think it's it's value, right? Because, you know, your family, right? Your your husband and maybe someday your daughter will listen to this, right? And for other, you know, guardians that are out there that are kind of trying to, you know, I, I don't like to use the phrase work-life balance, right? I think it's a harmony that we have to get to. Um, but it's, it right, the, the process of deciding for your individual family what that what that harmony looks like is different for all of us, but it's a real thing, right? It is. And, and sometimes the harmony gets a little, a little out of kilter and you kind of got to, you kind of rebalance a little bit um, because that's what kind of keeps us in uniform. You know, we always say that, you know, we're very proud to wear the cloth of our nation. Um, but one day, right, we're all going to retire or separate and move on to do other great things. Um, but it's our loved ones or families that will be with us until the end. So you got it. We have to right constantly work on that harmony, and and you can't do it alone, right? You need you need men and women. You know you need your support network that's that's around you. So so you know talking about family. Uh, so Camperi said that uh, your your mom and your dad were here for the ceremony. Yes, chief. So so you know on that thread about you know your kind of support network. How do you how do you maintain and work you know for your harmony in life? It's it's tough. Um, I'm dual mill, so I'm I'm married to another uh, Space Force officer. So luckily, um, our leadership has always been supportive. Um, we've never been geographically separated, um, and I've been very blessed in that fact. So, um, but here in Colorado, it's it's just the two of us and our two year old daughter. But we're lucky to have family that's willing to travel to us to help us or. Um, to really support us in that way. Um, we're lucky to have our, our military community too, our neighbors, our fellow um, Space Force members to, to help us out. I've gotten offers of like, I'll pick your kid up at the CDC if you need help, or if he's TDY, then my leadership is is receptive if I need to stay home if she's sick, or, you know, I've had that that grace and that, that balance from from up above me and below me I've got and then my teams I can't I can't speak highly enough of my teams the fact that they are so capable and they know exactly what to do it means that I don't have to be there every second of the day I don't they have it under control and maybe like they might need a check-in every now and then but you know they've got this and it gives me the time and the space if I need to go take care of a family emergency or yeah. I can do that. Yeah, that, you know, when we talk about the guardian experience, right, that's all kind of part of that. And, you know, connection, you know, kind of enables, right, those type of relationships where, you know, someone that you work with or that you know, right, is willing to step in and kind of help you out. It takes a lot of courage, right, also too, right, mm-hmm. especially when you talk about family care, like who you leave your children with, right? Yes. That, that, you got to have a connection there, right, because mm-hmm. that, that is another – very serious kind of a decision that you have to make, but 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 I'm I'm really heartened to hear you know your experience and the network and the relationship that you've built that enables you and your and your husband to you know do military to kind of have that journey together um, and do it in a way that you know you have a support network and structure uh, to, to kind of have you do that because it's important it, it really is you know and 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 you know we talk about. And I talked about this a couple weeks ago on my um, on Capitol Hill, right? And because it was, we talked about quality of life, and what I said was quality of life, in and of itself, cannot be just looked at independently. It's all about readiness, right? The quality of life and the experience that, are, whether it be sailors, soldiers, guardians, airmen, marines, has a direct impact uh, on our readiness, our ability to do our job, right? If you're worried about who's watching your children, what are we going to do? I can't get a, a, I can't get a medical appointment. The CDC is full. Um, you know, you don't feel like you're, you're living in a safe space, right? Wherever, wherever that is. 
um, it all starts to chip away at our mental readiness to kind of get after that. And, you know, when you think about the context of the discussions we had about great power competition and where we have to go, I mean, that, that could be a, a huge impact. Um, so, you know, the, you know, with that, with the, Hey, we know, like General Saltzman said, as a military, we, we, we break things, right. And we kill people. That's kind of what we do, even though we predominantly work in a cognitive domain, but as part of the joint force, right. We're all about applying force when we need to and be lethal as much as we can. And, and in the context of GPC, it's really serious. The secretary has said like we have to get after this as a service. So, you know, a lot of things came out in the last couple of days in the speeches and the announcements. So, so Lieutenant Novak, you know, from a great power competition perspective, you know, listening to what the secretary said, the undersecretary, you know, and General Salzman, you know, now when you go back, what do you, what do you think to bring back to the unit, right? How is this, has this changed your perspective or your focus area? And when you think about GPC and kind of where we're going? It's actually really interesting. So we were listening to those speeches with my parents in the crowd and my fiance's parents. And when they got up there, like, that made me want to sign up. That that really motivated me. But for for the rest of us, I think the message has been loud and clear for a while, especially on our end. So the the same thing I told my team before I even came out here is the same thing that I'm going to keep saying when I get back. And that's you know, there is so much that needs to happen to be ready for great power competition, to be ready for competitive endurance. And, you know, not all of that is in your control. We have our mission. And then inside that mission, we are the team of engineers. And so the one part in our control is, will the engineers be ready for great power competition? Will the engineers in three SOPs? And that's what we can control. And that's what we get after day after day. Um, so, I think really it spread the message to people outside of uniform, but for me, the, the message has been loud and clear and for my team and for, I think the squadron and the Delta and the broader military community guardians, especially it, it, it hasn't, it hasn't changed that much and people are still going to just keep chasing it, getting after it. So, you know, you said something interesting about, um, you know, the engineers, right. In the, in the, in the, is it MSC, the mission support element? I can't remember what yes, the, sir. um, so General Salzman, you know, in, in that context, you know, we can't afford anymore to have like little pockets of, of excellence, right? They're all in the fight together. And, you know, he unveiled and talked about the first initiative in the development of people that we're getting after is the is a new officer training course. And he kind of outlined that, you know, where, you know, someone now will commission into the service and an opportunity to, to kind of go through the, you know, cyber school do some, you know, fellowship and go through Intel and then the satellite operations and then kind of pick pick a path. So, so ma'am, I'm, I'm curious, now that you kind of heard that, um, because you're an acquirer as an uh, engineer? Yes, yes, Chief, I'm a 6'2". So, so when, you, when you hear the new philosophy, right, what they're going to do now, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, that? That's a dramatic kind of shift in how we do things. Definitely. I'm honestly really excited and a little jealous, if I'm honest. Um, I think if I giving the opportunity for officers to jump in and see what it is actually about and step into the real shoes of, you know, the environment um, that you'd be working in, the type of tasks that you're going to be dealing with, it really helps them make a better decision on how to plan the rest of their career. They can um, I think they can kind of visualize themselves like in, do I want to be a material leader? Do I want to be a squadron commander? Do I not want to do something completely out of none of those things? Right. So they can start to kind of make those decisions and they're, they're more informed. It's not, it, it's not just based yeah. off of what somebody else has told them. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, regardless of what I think going into the future, what they kind of decide you know, being that they had exposure and kind of a foundation will make them a better, you know, some uh, uh, force modernization, acquire engineer, intelligence operator, right? Because they had some exposure to some other stuff because we're really trying to close the gaps and seams. But but from the guard experience, like you said, it's an informed decision. I, you know, I remember my personal experience. You know, I was a maintainer when I joined the Air Force 30 years ago. And um, when I was in my, I was a senior airman. I was in my careers window is what we refer to it. Well, I was able to retrain and I remember going to the training office and trying to decide like what I wanted to do in my career if I wanted to try to do something different and all I had was a book with printed up pieces of paper 
And I remember coming across like one Charlie six and reading the description of what to do. And I literally went home and told my wife, I'm going to work for NASA. I'm going to be flying the space shuttle. Right. Cause I read this piece of paper and man, like it is awesome. I'm going to be a space operator. I'm going to wear a blue flight suit. And, um, you know, I went to school. I learned about orbital mechanics. I learned about space and they sent me to Colorado work in a windowless room. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I, what happened? What, I thought I was going to the Cape. Like how'd this work out? Um, now I'm really happy. I made that decision, but, but in the, it, you know, to kind of draw the, the correlations, you know, General Salsman said, you know, some of this is that we're asking individuals to kind of make it a career decision, maybe based on the advice or pr- perspective of one or two individuals or just, you know, reading a trifold somewhere at the recruiting office. So I, I think this model will, will, you know, be more well-informed, but I think it will also help grow um, um, more, more st- stronger and more well-informed guardians, right, to, to, into the operational realm. So, Isabel, i got to ask you, so, you know, this is going to kind of, now this is just the first phase of this transformation, right, working on looking at the officer development course. But this is going to have changes on the enlisted core uh, as well. Um, you know, I don't know if you had a chance to read the, the kind of OEC document that kind of came out, like rules and responsibilities. But, you know, as General Salzman highlighted, the kind of key takeaways on the enlisted core is, you know, we are the, the subject matter expertise, expert, experts, and we are the war fighters of the service. And that's exactly what it says. So, you know, I know, you know, it, it'll be hard for you, but eventually we'll have to leave BMT. And, 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 you know, move on to your next adventure, um, probably at an operational unit. So when you look at the discussion we've had and kind of where we're going, you know, as, as a non-commissioned officer, what are your thoughts on, hey, th- this kind of change, what is, what is it going to look like? I'm actually excited for the change, Chief. Um, it's something, when I first joined the Space Force, there was a kind of the culture shift of cyber and intel support space. But as we shifted through the years, it's, hey, we all have our own mission sets. And by starting off with the officers, they now understand, all right, this is exactly what Intel does. This is exactly what cyber does. This is exactly what space does. This is how we leverage our best guardians and the best mission sets for it. We do at BMT right now teach a baseline of cyber, Intel, and space to the guardians. So that way they have that critical thinking when they go to the tech school. Oh, I know a little bit about uh, signals intelligence. This is how it can impact me. But Moving on into an operational side, as my heart will be broken, um, I'm excited to see it. Having more well-versed guardians, um, when we talk about everyone is a guardian, even the civilians, it's important for us to all understand the mission sets and how to be a warfighter. And as General Saltzman says, we can't just say, hey, just be a warfighter. War and I see it throughout the force that we are defining what is a warfighting guardian, what is a guardian. And I think that's something the force and our young guardians have been able to slowly be able to define themselves. Yeah, you know, General Saltzman said it in his speech, right? Um, you know, this re- uh, reoptimization, if you will, it's not something that I mean, we have to do it, but the, the, the thought process looking at it is that we get the opportunity to do it. And, you know, I think as a service with, you know, only being four years old and it's true, right. That as a space force, we were kind of established under the, the context of great power competition. So there's, there's still like, we're still evolving and changing. Um, but, but we were kind of, we've been on this path for a little bit. When you just look at the, the, the specific functional areas that we recruit and commission into right engineering acquisition intel cyber space and, and, and just only three functional areas for the enlisted corps you know we're kind of very lean and very focused on what we do but it doesn't mean the journey's over right this is and, and so this evolution with focus on great power competition though we've might have been focused on that but it gave us the opportunity to, to continue to refine that and just course correct we're not changing the vision we're going into. We have the same vision. We're to the same end state of what the service needs to do. But but these are tweaks that we're making to get there. And I'm excited to see kind of where we go this year in, in 2024. But, you know, whatever that journey is this year, um, you know, bringing it back to why we're sitting around the table, it's going to be the value system, the values of the Guardians, the values of the Space Force that's going to allow us to be successful, Right. It's going to take courage to kind of, you know, embrace these changes and some roles and responsibilities will change. It's going to have to take a commitment, right, to kind of to kind of get after what we have to, you know, the skill craft. We talk about officers being, you know, mission planners and integrators and the enlisted corps being weapon system experts. We have to commit ourselves to that. 
the connection, right? As we kind of talk to one another, different organizations, you know, we spoke this morning about, you know, from a service perspective, you know, three SOPs or one SOPs or four SOPs cannot execute the mission alone. They have to work together. They have to build bridges where there aren't any natural ones. And we're just like we had the last couple of days, walking the halls, meeting guardians. Hey, what are you working on? And what are those connections? Right, that that is so vital to what we do. And then of course, what underpins everything, right, is our character. Um, and like we talked about, right, that is something that you know that's what we're looking for in guardians: is character and to, to, to kind of really bring that out of the men and women that serve, and then we give them the rest. So. So with that, I'm going to close and say congratulations again. Thank you very much for what you do. I'm really glad you had a chance to kind of make it out here um, to the ceremonies this week and you had your families with you. So hopefully it's a memorable experience. And when I go back to your units and you and, and interact with other guardians or other individuals, please share the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and inspire those around you and let them know that, that you know, it's a significant recognition and accomplishment to be um, to be a recipient of the Polaris Award. But really, it's any guardian could do that. Um, so again, thanks a lot for coming out. I appreciate it. And safe travels back home when you, when you depart later on today. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir.